Daenerys Targaryen with Khal Drogo with fear and barbaric splendor. Hi everybody, welcome to another re-reading video. Today, the second Daenerys chapter in A Game of Thrones, her wedding to Khal Drogo. <laughs> I loved this chapter. Every chapter that I get to, I'm amazed, blown away by how good it is, as if I forgot. So, Georgie boy. Great to be here. Him, he, I apologize for forgetting. <laughs> aye, aye, aye. Okay, let's get right to it. First thing to draw my attention was the fact that when the chapter starts, we have Viserys, Illyrio Mopatis, and Jorah Mormont all talking about Danny's marriage. Blah, 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 blah. blah, blah. And only two pages in, we realize that Daenerys is actually in the room with them. Then only a page later, three pages into the chapter, we hear her thoughts for the first time. This is like her point of view chapter. And she's absent from the chapter for the first two pages. And for the first three pages, she doesn't even think anything. And once you realize that she's there in the room, you're like, what? Uh, oh, okay. That's different than the way I imagined it in my head. They're all talking over her head, calling her the girl. And the three men there do not address her as if her marriage has nothing to do with her. Mm. Well, excuse me, princess. And she starts to speak, to actually say words aloud, only near the very end of her own chapter. Ay, 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 ay. She's, not, she's not important there, even though it's, it's her marriage. Ay, 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 that's some age-old mansplaining right there. Hmm. I'm more of an expert than you, and I'll tell you why, because I'm a guy. Another thing that I noticed pretty early in this chapter is how much Daenerys is afraid, frightened, terrified. It runs all throughout the chapter. She's afraid of Viserys, she's afraid of the Dothraki, and of course, she's in terror of Drogo. That's the most afraid she's ever been in her life. Okay? I want to repeat that. Her wedding day is the day that she is the most scared that she's ever been in her life. We are right now reading about the worst experience she's ever had up to now. Her wedding day. And let's remember her history, right? She has an abusive brother. She has grown up without parents, a nomad going from place to place. Being afraid that assassins are out there in the streets to kill her. Yeah! Yet all this pales compared to this very day. Her wedding day. Ay, 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 ay. And let's keep it 100. She's mostly afraid of the raping she knows she's going to go through after the wedding. Mm -hmm. After, and I quote, her brother gave her up. To the hulking giant. Okay, okay. Let's go a little bit through the main characters in this chapter, of course. Let's start with Daenerys. She has a beautifully subtle arc in this chapter. So she starts out as an object in the room, a thing that you exchange from something else. Then we start hearing her thoughts, right? She's trying also to cheer herself up, look in the mirror and telling herself, you're the blood of the dragon. Cheer up! Then she starts getting stuff, like gifts, for her wedding. So from the object, she is now an owner of other objects. From a commodity into an owner of commodities. Basically, for the first time, she owns shit. Okay? The girl who is owned by her brother. Then Illyrio Mopatis gives her three dragon eggs, and they seem to steer something in her. Her inner dragon is awaken. So her being sold as property uh, has turned her into a property owner and her being treated as an object has turned her into a subject because once she has the eggs she's never the same. And obviously getting the eggs, the dragon eggs, is the most important thing that happened in this chapter, right? They come from east of Ashai and they're the most beautiful thing Danny has ever seen. They're heavy, they look luxurious, they're scaled, they shimmer in the light. One is green, 
one is pale cream and one black. You know what that means, right? And once she gets her dragons, this is the first time that she utters anything. She asks, what are they? That line came 13 pages into the chapter on my Kindle. Ay, ay, ay. But her arc is not all the way there yet. Then Drogo gives her a horse. It makes an even bigger effect than the dragon eggs. Right now she's, she's not scared anymore. She has a living thing that is hers. And she rides the horse like one would ride a dragon. Her character now has agency. She trots and she gallops and she even jumps over a fire pit on a whim. Ah, that scared little thing is more than meets the eye. Bold prediction. And everyone's depressed around her. She's the blood of the dragon. That's the first time that she actually forgot to be afraid that evening. Or maybe ever. Hmm? And she even says something insightful. She asks Illyrio, tell Khal Drogo he has given me the wind. Boom. And that's not all. At the end, instead of being raped like an object, she ends up having a sort of consensual sex, in, at least in this medieval context, right? I'll talk a little bit more about that uh, in a moment, but let's just say for now that Drogo further wakes up her inner dragon and she's being active in this sexual encounter, which is her first, so that's saying something. So she turns from passive to active in a very compelling way from the beginning to the end of the chapter. That's a beautiful arc in this one little chapter. And that was my definite favorite thing in this really good part of the story. Okay, let's go on to Viserys. Oh, Viserys. Still pathetic. He treats Daenerys as property. He is giving away, you know, in a business transaction. Mm. But we do see the seeds of resentment between them being planted right now in this chapter. Because Daenerys is treated like a queen. And when they're seated in her marriage, marrying the lord, quote-unquote, of the Dothraki, he is seated below her and he's being offered food that she didn't want. Oh, and he's triggered such a snowflake. Right, he has a borrowed sword. Again, that Jorah gave to him and he eagerly accepted. But when you are this pathetic, you feel that you have to compensate. So he talks a good game and even threatens Jorah in one instance to cut off his tongue as if he could do it himself. Hmm? Because the only person that he can actually kick around is his 13-year-old sister. Oh, and the gift <laughs> that he gave his sister for her wedding day, first of all, was paid by Illyrio. So he gave, <laughs> he gave her three servants. One of them is there to teach her how to be better at sex. That's not creepy at all. And he eagerly points out that he had sex with that sex slave. Oh man, that's such an accomplishment. <laughs> I gave you this slave. And by the way, huh? Huh? like, you know, sexual intercourse. Hmm? You know what I mean? You know what I mean? Huh? Wink, wink, nudge, nudge. Say no more, say no more. Green, green, wink, wink, nudge, nudge. Say no more. Real classy, Viserys. Real classy. Okay, <laughs> so Jorah... After he gave Viserys the sword, he becomes their companion. So he seems to be like a good guy for now. I wonder if he has an ulterior motive to stay close to this brother and sister. He also gave Daenerys a really nice gift of history books about her homeland, right? About Westeros. And she loves that gift. So that makes him close both to the brother and the sister because she really appreciates that gift. You know, they have like a connection, her and Jorah. They both share like this longing to go back home. Ooh, so now let's talk a little bit about Drogo. I kind of forgot about that a little bit. So he doesn't speak English or the common tongue. So they haven't even talked. They have no common language to talk, to talk with. He speaks like this bastard Valyrian that she, whatever, is snobby about. And there's like a... A few minor issues, like the fact that he looks like a horrible monster. But when they have their first one-on-one -on -one interaction before the customary sex slash, slash rape, they have a very, very cute sort of conversation, only with the word no. It reminded me of this, the wire scene when they only use, say the word fuck. 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 
and also reminded me of several conversations that I've had abroad, like in India and in China and Mongolia and whatever, with people who don't speak English. Even in Eastern Europe, just I speak Hebrew, they respond in their own native tongue, and we just understand each other through signs and facial expressions and stuff like that. So I think he did it very well. Yes, it's true. So even though he's a monster, he looks like a devil, he speaks to her softly and he touches her tenderly. Hmm? He wants her to want him. He doesn't just force himself on it. They make out for hours, for hours. Ugh. So now if we disregard the fact that he just bought a woman and would have probably raped her had she not consented, that's a true feminist. You go, Carl. And in this chapter, we also got a very, very interesting glimpse to dragon dreams. Daenerys, she dreams of dragons, of a dragon specifically. And it's a very clairvoyant dream because we know what's coming next, right? She, she dreamt about Viserys hitting her in the way that he will do in a few chapters. And she dreams of her dragon being born. That's also going to happen, if you remember, right? And she dreams of her dragon fighting back, which she will do when he attacks her. And that dream was the scariest thing ever to her up to this wedding. So I found it really interesting that she's so scared of her inner dragon as she gives herself pep talks about being the blood of the dragon and seeing that the effect of the dragon eggs have on her. So I think it might be an early hint about how conflicted she is about her true identity and calling as a conqueror and destroyer. Let's, let's talk a little bit politics. Now we see the Dothraki, we see how their society works, what are the rules, traditions, political structure. The Kalasar numbers 40,000 warriors and women and children. The Dothraki are based on the Mongols and other steppe people. They are a mobile people living on a flat grassland. They don't need long and slow caravans to go through hills and forests and mountains. No, they move quick and they move everything. They don't have cities except this one city, right? This is a perfect place to be an incredible horseback rider. And during the wedding, we see the warriors fight a dance of death a term that says a lot about how they see fighting and dying. Their fighting style is beautiful. They fight quickly, also look kind of like the Mongols. And then it said about them, the Dothraki believed that all things are of importance in a man's life must be done beneath their open sky. And it's also said that their palaces are grass. So they are very, very, very different of the settled society with which they interact. Also, it makes sense to notice that they say all things of importance in a man's life, right? A woman's life, nobody cares. So they're camping outside of Pentos. And this is a great glimpse that is very well detailed and presented by him about the age-long tension between the settled society and the nomad society, right? It says the good folk of Pentos They've doubled the city guard when the Dothraki are there, even though this is a business transaction and everything's supposed to be fine. But they, they're still scared of them, right? The settled societies are also the ones who write history. So they're the good people and the nomads are the savages. But, but let's agree that the Dothraki make very little effort not to seem barbaric. But on the other, other hand, in Pentos they have slaves. So that's too a brutal society built on subjugation. But they do it with style. They have nice things. They live in beautiful houses with pools, wear nice clothes, and eat honey duck and orange snap peppers. But they are hypocrites about their values. They're no better than the barbarians. And you can take that hypocrisy of the 1% being violent in a more subtle and indirect way, and you can connect that to what's happening today in the world. A billionaire can shape policy that will hurt millions of people, but he will be polite about it. 
And if the rabble rousers start to whatever, make noise and protest, they're being impolite. No, come on, you have to be nice. You have to be nice. And we can see with Illyrio Mopatis, he is exquisitely dressed, but he stinks. And he dirties himself with grease when he eats. That's a great image to show this hypocrisy. And I found it interesting that, that the nomadic Dothraki, they cater to this hypocrisy when they dress up with good clothes and perfume when they get into the city. But outside, they're in their own element, they do them. They drink, they gorge themselves with blood pies, they mate like animals. They're like beasts in human skins, and they fight and kill for fun and for ego. There was this one scene when one Dothraki warrior killed another because they both wanted to rape the same girl. Mm. They both feel they have an unenviable right to rape this woman. And that the other was infringing on that constitutional right to rape this woman. And the winner, after he kills the other guy, he doesn't even uh, rape the woman that he won, right? Quote, unquote. He doesn't care. He doesn't care. Doesn't care, doesn't notice that he's raping another woman. <laughs> So the fight wasn't to get something that, that, that he wanted. That's not what the Dothraki are about. It's just a macho thing, right? They're moving up the pecking order in the sandbox. So those are crazy and frightening people. And Daenerys is marrying the fiercest and strongest and scariest of them. Ah, oh, that's damn scary. I feel for you, girl. But as the fearless leader's new wife, Daenerys will get a new standing in society. Hmm? By the way, I liked how Drogo's blood riders gave Danny gifts, like weapons, that were actually for Drogo. So she has to ceremonially refuse them and ask them to give them to Drogo. So even if the Dothraki is direct, no-nonsense culture, without sophistication, and without a veneer of civilization, they too have silly hypocritical customs. Ay, ay, ay. They also stink which is also a callback to steppe people and Mongols who used to ride for days upon days without changing their clothes. Sometimes even the clothes would stay on their backs long after they should have been thrown away. Like in a cultural thing that you have to wear out your shirt before you take a new one. And some more Dothraki customs, like Illyrio explains how they deal with Khal Drogo works, right? The Daenerys for the army deal that will allow Viserys to cross the narrow sea and take the Iron Throne. Hmm? So you give him something, Daenerys, and he gives you the throne. But first they have to go way, way, way to the east, to their capital, Vice Dothrak. Drogo will pay you back in his own time, when he chooses. After he'll think about it, you know, perhaps later. If the omens favor war, you know, it could be months, it could be years. You know, that sounds like a solid deal. Yeah, 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 Viserys is a very good business person. Okay, so Viserys, you give him now the only thing that you have that is worth something in exchange for him thinking about doing something for you maybe later. And, and Illyrio tells him, trust me, which is, as we know, a line that when said always inspires confidence. Trust me. Okay, believe me. Believe me. Believe me. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm sure everything will be fine. So what's Illyrio's angle? Okay, first of all, he got money as a reward for brokering that deal. And he doesn't seem too eager to see that Viserys gets his side of the deal. Hmm? He sees more intent on making Viserys confident that it's something good is going to happen, actually. So there are a lot of theories about what's uh, Illyrio's incentive, why he gave the nerves the dragon eggs and we can have that conversation in the comments. Viserys says, I peace on Dothraki omens. That sounds like a strong basis for a long-term strategic alliance with the Dothraki, right? Hmm? In Jorah too, he warns Viserys that the Dothraki do their things in their own time and don't respect people who beg. That irritates the future king Viserys. And he immediately threatens Jorah, right? And that, but that just shows how weak he is. We see all throughout the chapter how much respect and power Drogo has. He doesn't need to threaten anyone, doesn't, e doesn't even need to raise his voice. But Viserys says, he's the rightful lord of the Seven Kingdoms. I am the king! 
Mm. To which Tywin would say, Any man who must say, I am the king, is no true king. And there's this one line that many people remember, a Dothraki wedding without at least three deaths is deemed a dull affair by Illyrio Mupatis. Okay, okay, so I've gone on and on about how great this chapter is. Now I want to talk a little bit about the stuff I did not like. So first of all, Drogo and Daenerys having sex. Drogo lifts Daenerys to her horse as easily as if she was a child. She's uh, 13 years old. Hmm? Am I the only one who doesn't enjoy reading about a 13 year old having sex? Even though she wasn't raped in the terms of the social and political context of that time, because the sex scene wasn't like it was in the show, it's still very rapey. Huh? Because if someone would have asked Daenerys for her opinion on the matter beforehand, she would not have chosen to go up to easy place and hook up, right? So there were a lot of details in, in this sex scene and just like I felt uncomfortable about it, but I don't know, am I being conservative? Tell me what you think. But there was another thing that I did not like. I, it might seem petty, but I don't know. In among the gifts that Daenerys got are the masks. So I'm reading on my Kindle. I'm like, what's that with a small d? Clicking about that word. It's a figured and patterned fabric of silk, right? It's wool, linen, or cotton, whatever, woven with all kinds of stuff. It's from the Byzantine and Islamic lands in the early Middle Ages. Because the reason I clicked on that, because I said Damascus, that sounds an awful lot like Damascus, the now capital of Syria, but Damascus does not exist in Planetos, so that word just shouldn't be there. Obviously, words and languages, they're always derived from history and culture, so the common language should not be English, da 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 da, -da. But we suspend our disbelief, right? But when he puts in a word that clearly doesn't fit this world, the masks, that is in my eyes a, a mistake, just an, an error. Well, I find that pretty offensive, so yeah, yeah. fuck you. <laughs> <laughs> that word should not be there. It throws you out of the story. And it's not even an important part of the story. So she could have just as well gotten a different kind of fabric with a less specific name. It's not as if we know what Damask is, but it pops out as being from Damascus. And that's actually not the only kind of example that I remember from the story. There was one time in a future chapter, I don't remember when, when he said, uses the word, I think, piazza. And I was like, piazza? Are there Italian people over there in uh, Westeros? Mm. Tell me what you think, and, uh, and if you enjoyed the video, click like, subscribe, and also click here to watch all the rereading videos from the beginning, and I'll see you all next time. Thank you for tuning in. Bye-bye.